Hello, welcome to CEY 2019. My name is Graham Lackis. Today I'm going to take you through a lecture titled Risky Business, The Major Glaucoma Risk Factors. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce the concept of relative risk in glaucoma, and we'll talk about how to apply those strategies in glaucoma management. We'll go through some of the systemic and ocular glaucoma risk factors and go a little bit more into depth so we can understand them in a little bit more detail. And we'll also discuss how risk factors can sometimes be different between glaucoma diagnosis and glaucoma progression. All right, first let's define what glaucoma risk factors are. Basically, glaucoma is a heterogeneous collection of eye diseases. There's primary open angle glaucoma, there's normal tension, acute angle closure, chronic angle closure, secondary glaucoma such as pseudo-exfoliation, pigment dispersion, traumatic glaucoma, uvidic glaucoma. The only real commonality between all the different glaucomas is that there's a progressive loss of retinal ganglion cells and a characteristic thinning of the neuroretinal rim tissue of the optic nerve. Now, if you think about it, there really are two main risks when we talk about glaucoma. Number one, and what we're going to discuss predominantly today, are the risk factors that are associated with the development of glaucoma and the risk factors for the progression of glaucoma, such as race and gender, the systemic risk factors such as diabetes or high blood pressure, and ocular risk factors such as intraocular pressure, etc. So we'll go through those in more detail today. The other factor to think of, though, and we're not really going to go through it today, is the risk of glaucoma not actually being detected. And that's often a more critical factor than some of the other risk factors that we automatically think of. In some of the large population studies, they found that around half the population has glaucoma, but are unaware of their disease diagnosis. So in 5,000 subjects in Greece, there were 57% undiagnosed, and in Australia, over 3,500 subjects around 51% had undiagnosed glaucoma. The reason for this is that there's no definitive diagnostic test for glaucoma or a unique clinical sign that applies just to glaucoma. For example, there's a wide overlap in cup to disc ratio between normals and those with glaucoma, and the same with intraocular pressure. There's a large overlap between normals and those with the disease. All right, let's talk about relative risk or it's also known as the risk ratio. It's a calculation based on the incidence of disease in one group compared to a control group. So if the risk ratio or relative risk is one, that means the factor that's being studied does not affect the outcome of the disease. If the relative risk is below one, that means the factor is protective against the disease. And if it's greater than one, the factor leads to an increased risk of de developing the disease. The problem with relative risk is that it assumes causation rather than association. And sometimes it's not actually possible to tell if it's just a spurious association rather than the risk factor actually causing the disease. Now, other than relative risk alone, we need to consider the absolute risk of the condition. Say, for example, the relative risk of developing macular degeneration in a smoker is four times. If the absolute risk of having macular degeneration is half a percent, then four times half a percent is only a 2% risk of occurrence. And really, that's not terribly relevant or terribly risky for that patient. However, if macular degeneration occurs in 20% of the population over 70, then a four times risk gives you an 80% risk of developing the disease, which is a highly significant risk factor. And as you can see from that, relative risk becomes more important in diseases that are more prevalent. If a disease is rare, then the relative risk really does not contribute greatly to a general population risk. And if we think of it the other way, if we're going to do risk reduction measures, they're far more beneficial the greater your initial risk of the disease. The OATS study is a very good example. In OATS, subjects had a pressure between 21 and 32 at the time of enrollment, and they had no structural or functional deficits. Half of them were treated, around 817, and half were placed on observation for a period of five years, 
And now we actually have 10 year data as well. In the treatment group, the intraocular pressure was lowered by 20%, actually around 22%. And the study found that it reduced your risk of developing glaucoma by around 50%. The actual figures were 9.5% developed glaucoma in the control group and 4.5% in the treated group. So just over 50% reduction in your risk. So if we reduce risk by half, that initially appears to be highly beneficial. So doesn't that mean we should treat everyone with ocular hypertension and cut their risk of developing glaucoma in half? Not really. We need to consider the individual risk of different sub subsets of the study population. So if you run the OAT study risk calculator, you find that there are different levels of risk. So at the lowest risk band, you have less than 4% chance of developing glaucoma. And the highest band, you have over 33, often 40% or more risk of developing the disease. So if you're in the lower band with a risk of 4% and you reduce that risk by 50% or by half, you have a risk of developing glaucoma of about 2%. Difference between 4% and 2% is not particularly meaningful. However, you're, if you're in the highest risk group where you have, say, 40% risk of developing glaucoma, going on treatment will cut your risk by half, which will mean you'll only have a 20% chance of developing the disease. And that's a highly meaningful intervention. Now, patients often have more than one risk factor. Are these risk factors additive? And how are they additive? So if you have a two-time risk due to one factor and a four-time risk to, due to another factor, do you actually have an eight times risk? For example, if glaucoma has an incidence of 3% in the community, times two times four will give you a 24% risk, correct? Really, nobody knows that for sure. We're not sure if risk factors are additive, multiplicative, or the major risk factor is all that contributes to increased risk and minor risk factors don't contribute any further. Really, nobody knows truly at this stage. The other factor to think of, does one risk factor override all the others? Let's say you have the bad genes for cardiovascular disease. Your siblings have died of heart attacks, your parents, your uncles, your aunties, everyone's dying of heart disease. If you have a healthy lifestyle, does that reduce your risk of having heart disease yourself? Example, we've all heard of cases of marathon runners or professional athletes that have died young of a massive heart attack. And everybody says, yes, they've had bad genes. Or alternatively, if you don't have a cancer gene, can you engage in poor behavior and not have consequences of developing cancer? For example, we've heard of smokers that have lived to 100. They, the fact of smoking hasn't really affected their lifespan. So what is the case? Can other risk factors override one or the other? Can lifestyle change your factors? A big study was done in the UK from the UK Biobank where 340,000 individuals have been genetically profiled in the 40 to 70 age group. And they were stratified for their risk of having um, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, or diabetes mellitus. And they were stratified into high, moderate, or low risk gene pools. Then they looked at whether modifiable lifestyle risks reduced your disease presence in all of those genetic groups. And what they found that if you had excellent genes and lived a poor lifestyle, say you had good family history, but you smoked and drank and were overweight and were diabetic, you had an equal risk of disease outcome as if you were a person that had bad genes, but lived a very healthy lifestyle. And again, the benefits of lifestyle were greatest in the highest risk categories, not so much in the low or moderate risk groups. So it does appear that lifestyle factors can influence genetic factors in a good way and vice versa. In Australia, we have the National Health and Medical Research Council Glaucoma Guidelines, which were last published in 2010. And in those guidelines, they've produced a risk table to take some risk factors into consideration that weren't necessarily considered in the ocular hypertension treatment study. And the idea of the NH and MRC um, risk table is to add points of risk 
over and above any features that were not included in the oats calculator. The oats calculator looked at things like age, vertical cup to disc ratio, pattern standard deviation, central corneal thickness, and intraocular pressure. For other factors, you were to consider those and add those risks to the OATS risk score. So for example, if you look at the NH and MRC table on the right, if you were a person that had pseudo exfoliation, which is in the light green band on the right, that would give you an extra two points of risk. If you had a family history glaucoma, which is in the orange band on the left, you would add an extra three points to your risk score. So they're assuming that risk is additive, but as I said, there's no strong clinical evidence that's, that suggests that is truly the case. So the approach I take with glaucoma and multiple risk factors is to determine the patient's risk category via the OATS calculator. And if they're in the bottom two groups, which I've highlighted in green, so under 4% and 10% band, I'd consider them low risk. The middle band at 15% is your intermediate risk and the red um, squares, which I've highlighted on the lower right, have a risk of over 20%. They're considered high risk because remember in the general population, one to 3% of people develop glaucoma. So having a risk of 33% is much higher than the general population. And then what I do on the fingers of one hand, or hopefully not two hands, I'll count the number of additional risk factors. So if someone has pseudo exfoliation and a family history and is diabetic, I'll you know, add three extra risk points. And if someone's in the green band in the low risk category with maybe one additional risk factor or no additional risk factors, I'd be very comfortable in monitoring those. If they're in the low risk category and they have multiple additional risk factors, say two, three or four additional risk factors, I'd be more likely to treat them. If they're in the high risk category, even if there are no additional risk factors, I think they would warrant treatment in most cases unless they're very elderly. And if they're in the high risk band and they have multiple additional risk factors such as family history or trauma or pseudo exfoliation or drance hemorrhages, I would more likely, I'd definitely treat them, but more likely to review them very frequently and treat them more aggressively with a tighter target pressure to make sure that they don't deteriorate rapidly. Now, relative risk is not always evenly distributed across all the different glaucoma subtypes. Some risk factors are more critical, for example, in normal tension glaucoma and have very little relevance to primary open angle glaucoma. So you should always consider the type of glaucoma in the patient in front of you when you're doing your risk factor analysis. For example, females are more represented in narrow angle glaucoma, males more so in pigment glaucoma. Disc hemorrhages are more critical in normal tension glaucoma and don't seem to make much difference in primary open angle disease. As the OAT study showed us, a very thin central corneal thickness is more critical in conversion from ocular hypertension to glaucoma than in patients that have low pressures already, such as normal tension glaucoma. So always consider the type of glaucoma when you do your risk factor analysis. And towards the end of the lecture, we'll go into these risk factors in more detail. Another issue that comes into play when discussing glaucoma with your patients is the risk of extraneous risk factors that they might have heard about in the lay media. So often here in Australia, we'll get articles on, in newspapers or on television, current affairs shows that talk about, oh, if you have glaucoma, swimming goggles will make your disease worse and cause you to go blind. So there are common misconceptions in the general population. So patients will sometimes ask you, if I wear swimming goggles, will that cause me to get glaucoma? If I do yoga and bend over or invert in my exercises, will that cause me to have high intraocular pressure and cause me to have glaucoma? I've heard that wearing a necktie will make your glaucoma worse, or if, you're, if you sit up in bed while you sleep, that'll prevent you from getting glaucoma. And what we have to do is explain to our patients that these sort of risk factors can increase the rate of progression or deterioration in patients that have advanced glaucoma or highly unstable disease, but in most people in the normal population or with 
relatively mild, moderate or stable glaucoma, they really don't cause any issues at all. So you can reassure them that yes, most of the time it's okay to wear a necktie and you won't make your disease worse. All right, why don't we have a more detailed look at the glaucoma risk factors. Firstly, we'll look at non-modifiable risk factors such as race, gender, age, family history, and your genetics. Things that we can't currently do anything about. Maybe in the future we'll be able to modify our genetics. 